Today's video is sponsored by Audible. Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment, with an unbeatable selection of audio titles for you to enjoy and learn from. Their virtual library is filled to the brim with the best audiobooks, binge-worthy podcasts, and exclusive originals you won't find anywhere else, across every genre, all read by professional voice actors, celebrities, and authors. By listening rather than reading, you can fit more books and information into your schedule, while also getting on with cooking, cleaning, or relaxing or if you're like me, while you're out walking, exercising, or traveling. So when it comes to horror, thrillers, and true crime, I can assure you Audible really has you covered, with tens of thousands of suspenseful titles. Recently, I enjoyed listening to People Who Eat Darkness, the real-life story of Lucy Blackman, a young woman who disappeared in Tokyo and turned up dismembered in a seaside cave. The book is masterfully narrated by voice actor Simon Vance, who really immerses you in this rabbit hole of a case. Right now, there's a special offer of 60% off your first three months. Visit audible.com forward slash lazy masquerade or text lazy masquerade to 500 500. With a membership, you'll not only have unlimited access to Audible's huge library of audio titles, but you'll also get to choose one title each month to keep forever. So again, head to audible.com forward slash lazy masquerade or text lazy masquerade, all one word, to 500 500. The case of Charles Morgan is perhaps one of the strangest I've ever come across, like something ripped straight from the pages of a David Lynch script. And let me tell you, it's absolutely filled to the brim with a whole host of cryptic clues that'll leave you scratching your heads. Impossible situations, undercover agents, hitmen, and the mafia. And this one's got it all, and you'll soon realize why it's left investigators baffled for years. So get your shovels ready because we're about to dig into this bizarre rabbit hole and see if we can figure out what really happened to Charles Morgan. Charles, or as he preferred to be called, Chuck Morgan, was a 39-year-old successful businessman, the head escrow agent at Statewide Escrow. Described by those who knew him as an unassuming workaholic, Chuck still managed to make time for his family and made a point of driving two of his four young daughters to school every morning. March 22, 1977, was no exception. That morning, he and his daughters left their home in Tucson, Arizona. He dropped them off at the school gates and set off for work. Thing is, he never made it to the office that morning. After dropping his girls off, Chuck vanished. When he didn't return home that evening, his family, of course, began worrying about his well-being, and wondered what could have possibly happened to him. For three long days, he was missing, and his family prayed for his safe return. At 2am on March 25th, those prayers were half answered, when Chuck came hobbling through the front door of his family home, looking like an absolute mess. According to his wife, Ruth, Chuck was missing a shoe had a set of plastic handcuffs wrapped around one of his ankles, and his hands were bound together with a plastic zip tie. He had clearly just escaped from some terrible situation. Ruth quickly realized that for whatever reason, Chuck was unable to speak, but the look on his face alone made it clear that he was terrified. As Ruth frantically tried to ask him what had happened and where he had been for the past three days, Chuck rushed to grab a pen and paper and wrote down that he had been captured and tortured and that his captors had painted a hallucinogenic into the inside of his throat. He wrote that if he ingested this substance, it would either drive him irreparably insane, or completely destroy his nervous system, outright killing him. He didn't name who had taken him, who had painted this thing into his throat, but instead simply wrote down for Ruth to move the car from outside. He didn't want them to know he had come home. Ruth moved the car then immediately went to go and call the police. Chuck stopped her. If you call the cops, Chuck wrote down, they'll kill all of us, even the girls. I wanted to call a doctor and the police, Ruth later said, but Chuck was adamant that that would be signing a death warrant for the entire family. For a whole week, Chuck laid low in the family home. Ruth nursed her husband back to health by feeding him with an eyedropper, but although he physically recovered from his ordeal, mentally he was a wreck. 
before his voice returned, Chuck confessed to Ruth that for the past few years, he had been working as an undercover agent for the federal government, specifically for the Treasury Department, covertly helping them fight organized crime and stopping the mob from defrauding the government. They took my Treasury ID, he wrote, still refusing to name names. Chuck continued to keep his lips sealed for the sake of his family, but even so, still feared for his own life. He took to wearing a bulletproof vest wherever he went, and made sure that his daughters never had to walk to or from school. He still refused to tell anyone who tormented him and why, but did tell his own father that if anything were to happen to him, he had hidden a letter somewhere in the house explaining the entire situation. Don't tell Ruth about that note though, he told his father, lest she go looking for it prematurely. It wasn't for her eyes or for anyone else's, not while he was still alive at least. After two months with no further incidents, Ruth began to believe that this confusing and scary chapter in the Morgan family life story was finally coming to an end. But those two months were just the calm before the real storm. On June 7th, Chuck once again disappeared while on his way to work. Nine days later, an unidentified woman called the Morgan family household. Ruth answered the phone. Ruthie? Yes? Chuck is alright. Ecclesiastes 12, 1 through 8. After leaving that message, the unknown woman immediately hung up the phone. Ruth got out her Bible and flipped to the passage the woman had named, Ecclesiastes 12, 1 through 8. That passage reads as follows Men are afraid of a high place and of terrors on the road. Remember him before the silver cord is broken and the golden bowl is crushed. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. What was that supposed to mean? Two more days after receiving that cryptic message, Chuck's lifeless body was found in the desert near San Juan Springs. He had been dead for approximately 12 hours. He was still wearing his Kevlar vest, but had been shot through the back of the head. The shot had come from his own magnum, which was lying in the dust beside him. Strangely, no fingerprints were found on it, or on anything else at the scene for that matter. Residue on Chuck's left hand indicated that he had fired a weapon though. Chuck was also wearing a belt, the buckle of which concealed a sharp blade. Detectives also found Chuck's car nearby. Inside was a note with directions to Chuck's body as well as a pair of sunglasses that definitely didn't belong to him. There was also a box full of ammo. On the back seats, they found one of Chuck's teeth wrapped up in a white handkerchief. The strangest clue of all, however, was found on Chuck's person. He had clipped a $2 bill to the inside of his underwear. On this bill, he had written seven Spanish surnames, beginning with the letters A through G. Above those names, he had written Ecclesiastes 12 and drawn arrows towards the note's serial number, indicating the verses 1 through 8, the same verse the mysterious woman on the phone had mentioned to Ruth. A crudely drawn map on the back of the bill led detectives to the towns of Robles Junction and Salacity, both of them in the area between Tucson and Mexico, and both of them infamous for smuggling. What was Chuck alluding to with this mysterious clue? Had the bell been planted on him, or had he left it there himself? A sort of secret message? What was the Bible passage meant to indicate? And more importantly, who was the woman who had called Ruth to mention it? In spite of all these puzzling and suspicious clues, investigators were quick to rule that Chuck had taken his own life, which, in the eyes of many people, just doesn't add up. Obviously, his wife disagreed with that conclusion, saying that Chuck would have never left his girls, Investigative journalist Don Devereaux also called Bull and stated, quote unquote, I've never seen, in all of my years as a journalist, a fellow take himself out in the desert wearing a bulletproof vest and shoot himself in the back of the head. Two days after Chuck's body was discovered, a mysterious woman called up the Pima County Sheriff's Department. She called herself Green Eyes 
and said that she was the same woman who had called Ruth. Green Eyes claimed that in the week leading up to Chuck's demise, he had been hiding out in a motel. She apparently had visited him at the motel and said that Chuck had a suitcase filled with thousands of dollars. Apparently, he told her that the money was to pay off an assassin that was after him. Someone had put out a $90,000 contract on his life, and it was increasing at a rate of $5,000 a day. He said that he was going to meet the hitman himself and buy back his life. Whether that version of events is true or not remains to be seen, since to this day, nobody knows who Green Eyes really was, or even what her connection was to Chuck. But given that she called Ruth shortly before her husband's untimely fate, quoting the same passage as found on the $2 bill, and that later, CCTV footage came to light showing an unknown woman with Chuck at a motel, it's clear that she wasn't just some nobody pretending to be involved in the case for attention. But why was she continuing to involve herself in it? And was she a friend of Chuck's? Or a foe? Speaking of friend or foe, shortly after Chuck's demise, two well-dressed men came to Ruth's home and knocked on the front door. They claimed to be FBI agents and quickly flashed their badges, barely giving Ruth a chance to examine them. They opened and closed their identification very fast, said Ruth. They said they wanted to come in and look through the house. They never said what they were looking for. Ruth felt too intimidated to ask for the agents' names, but whoever they were, they turned her house upside down, searching for something. Now, you might be asking, lazy, what was written in that letter that Chuck left behind? The one he had hidden in the house, explaining who was behind all this? Well, here's the thing. Despite searching high and low for it, that letter has never been found. As such, we have no idea what information Chuck left behind, or if there ever was a letter at all. But, assuming Chuck wasn't lying, assuming he really had left behind a note explaining everything, then why hasn't it been found after all these years? Well, perhaps it was. Perhaps those men that paid Ruth a visit weren't really FBI agents after all. Perhaps that's what they turned her house upside down searching for. Chuck's full confession. A piece of evidence that could have brought down some powerful people. Maybe they got their hands on Chuck's missing letter before anyone else could find it. The man who kept this whole mystery alive, the aforementioned reporter, Don Devereaux, heard about how the FBI had torn Ruth's house apart looking for something. Sure that Chuck hadn't taken his own life, and determined to get to the bottom of this case, Devereaux called up the FBI himself and asked them what their search was all about. To his surprise, they told him that they had never paid a visit to Ruth's house at all, and that they didn't even know who Chuck was. When I made a Freedom of Information Act request to the FBI, they had never heard of Charles Morgan, despite the fact that they obviously opened an investigation. Despite the fact the FBI interviewed Mr. Morgan's attorney. They were all over this thing like a blanket for a while, but now they've never heard of the guy. He never existed. No card, no file, no nothing. It should also be mentioned here that someone, or someones, broke into Chuck's impounded car and his office at around the same time these men searched Ruth's home. Both the car and office had been trashed, as if the intruders had desperately been searching for something in particular. So, the way I see it, there are three main theories as to how Chuck ended up in the desert, dead. Theory 1. Chuck really had decided to end his own life, and left behind a trail of breadcrumbs and mysterious clues to lead everyone on a wild goose chase. This theory is supported by the fact that Chuck's own magnum was used to end his life, and there was gunpowder residue on his hand. But honestly, I'm not buying this one, and nor are most other people, including his family, Don Devereaux, and a slew of other investigators. Sure, the fatal shot came from his own magnum, but that doesn't mean that he was the one who fired it especially considering the shot came through the back of his head. Furthermore, the residue was found on his left hand. Chuck was a right-handed. Why would he use his wrong hand to fire into the back of his head? It also doesn't make sense that a man intent on ending his own existence was walking around wearing a Kevlar vest. Not to mention, some of the evidence found at the scene points towards someone else being present when Chuck died. 
specifically the sunglasses and Chuck's missing tooth, which were found in the car. Now I'm willing to accept I could be wrong about all that. It is possible that Chuck just left behind some elaborate clues to make his demise seem more mysterious. But what really rules this theory out for me is Green Eyes. For her to have called Ruth before his death, to have mentioned the same passages found written on the $2 bill, and to have known about Chuck's alleged ties to the mob. Either she was someone who helped Chuck fake this whole mystery before he ended himself, or, more believably, she knew that Chuck was in some hot water. Theory 2. Chuck really was an undercover federal agent, and was taken out during one of his missions after his cover had been blown. Chuck had told his wife that he had secretly been working to bring down the mob, and the fact the FBI acted as if he had never existed could have been them covering their tracks. Chuck clearly knew he was in mortal peril, and that secret $2 bill under his clothes could have been his way to communicate a message, to pass on some coded information to another agent. Others have speculated that Chuck had some information about some high-level politicians and their dodgy connections with the criminal underworld. Maybe they wanted him to disappear before he could make that information public. The main hole in this theory, though, is that we don't know whether Chuck really was an agent. Maybe he just lied to his wife to cover up the real truth. That truth being, theory three, Chuck was working with the mob. He helped them embezzle funds, and was taken out because he knew too much. There's actually more evidence for this theory than you might expect. After Chuck's story aired on the show Unsolved Mysteries, Don Devereaux, who worked on assignments for the show, received an influx of tips. It turned out that in the four years leading up to his demise, Chuck had been involved in money laundering and illegal transactions in gold and platinum. We're talking billions of dollars. Allegedly, he had been using his position in the escrow company to help organize crime syndicates and international government officials make a fortune. Chuck lived and worked in Arizona, the only state at the time that had certain blind trust laws, meaning that an escrow agent like him would have been the only one who knew about his clients' dodgy transactions, making the state a haven for mob groups like the Ned Warren family and the Joe Bonanno family. Chuck was allegedly helping both of those families launder money. Apparently, there were even undercover CIA agents helping Chuck to do this, in return for a slice of the pie of course. But here's the most important piece of information in my eyes. Devereaux found out that Chuck kept duplicate records of all of these transactions. He likely kept these to use as a bargaining chip, just in case his nefarious business partners turned against him. Now this doesn't necessarily mean that Chuck wasn't an undercover operative. After all, he may have been authorized to carry out illegal transactions as part of his mission, and kept the records as evidence to use against his clients. But if this theory's correct, then in all likelihood, Chuck was dealing with some super shady individuals for his own personal gain, but bit off much more than he could chew. Either way, I personally think it's likely that those records were the reason Chuck was killed. I believe that when the existence of a paper trail came to light, his partners knew he couldn't be trusted anymore. He may have been a rat, he may just have been protecting himself, but either way, he had to be taken care of. After he was dead, they then sent men to his home and his office to search for those records. Maybe Green Eyes was telling the truth. Maybe the hitman hired to take Chuck out had contacted him, told him to bring some cash out to the desert to buy his way out of the hit, then killed him anyway, took the money and ran. Double payday. On May 14th, 1990, just after Chuck's episode of Unsolved Mysteries aired, the body of Doug Johnston, a 35-year-old who worked at a computer graphics company, was found in his car in his company's parking lot. He'd been shot through the back of the head. Why do I bring this up? Doug Johnston worked just across the street from reporter Don Devereaux, the man who kept bringing attention to the Chuck Morgan case. Doug Johnston and Don Devereaux drove almost identical cars. Many people, including Devereaux himself, believed that he was the intended target, and that, for the unfortunate Mr. Johnston, this was a case of wrong place, wrong car, wrong time. 
it seems likely that someone wanted to take Devereaux out for his work on the episode, and for continuing to bring attention to Chuck's case all these years later. One year after that, Devereaux was contacted by a writer from DC, a guy named Danny Casalaro. Casalaro asked Devereaux to give him any information he had about Chuck Morgan and his gold transactions. Devereaux agreed. However, he never got the chance to share that information. Casalero was found dead in his hotel bathroom in West Virginia before Devereaux could ever meet him. Twelve deep slashes covered his forearms and wrists. It appeared as if Casalero had taken his own life, but that just didn't make any sense at all. Casalero was extremely squeamish when it came to the sight of blood, and put up a fuss whenever his doctor brother tried to prick his finger for blood work. The coroner also determined that he hadn't been alone at the time of his death. There was bruising on his arm and head, and the tops of three of his fingernails were missing, as if he had put up a fight. A professional cleaning crew just so happened to come into his hotel room the next day and erase all of the evidence. Now, either those two additional deaths were a massive coincidence, or someone was trying to silence Devereaux, to stop him from reporting on the case and from helping others to do so. Devereaux himself certainly believes that the bullet used to kill Doug Johnston was meant for him, and that Casalero was whacked by a hired hit squad, but whether they were hired by the mob or some government official remains to be seen. So, and that's the story of Chuck Morgan, the man who knew too much. Probably. There are still too many unanswered questions to come to any definitive conclusion, but in my estimation, Chuck was a smart guy who just got in over his head with the wrong people. But even if I'm right, I'm still stumped when it comes to things like the $2 bill. But what do you think? Who killed Chuck Morgan? Was he really an undercover agent, working against the mob, or was he secretly working with them all along? Did the authorities help to cover all of this up? Who was the mysterious witness, Green Eyes? A fellow agent? A secret woman in his life? Or someone with ties to organized crime? What was Ecclesiastes 12 meant to signify? One unsolved mystery, a thousand unanswered questions. It's crazy to think a case as surreal as this one actually happened, and that someone, somewhere knows why. Unfortunately, even if we do get a conclusive answer as to who that person or group is, Ruth Morgan will never get the closure she so desperately sought. She passed away in 2006 never knowing what her husband was truly involved in, or the identity of the people who took his life. But until her dying day, she was certain of one thing. That Chuck didn't take his own life. A big thank you to Robin Mickelson for making the thumbnail for this one, as well as a huge shout out to all of my supporters here on YouTube and over on Patreon, especially my biggest supporters. Thomas the Handsome, Alex Greensall, Asriel Warakai, Charlie Lackey, Colin Monsma, Connor Lothan, Crawford K. McDonald, Expandon, Gina Valera, Grace Archie, Infamous Sempapi, Keegan Eady, Leonardo Martinez, Mackenzie Griffin, Myra Lancaster, Monica Mendoza, Nadine, Natalie Escobedo, Peter Logjurich, Philip Westra, Procupidine Natter, Sarah Ramirez, Silas Geist, Taylor and Monica Gruenk, The Only Dorita, Zane, Ms. Crypto, Damian Bennett, The Deck of Cards, TNS Mum, Hamish K, and Lydia Glassley. Thank you guys so much for your continued support, it really helps the channel out. Remember to smash that like button or I'll smash you, and you'll hear from me again in the new year. Until then, you all stay spooky. And remember, the best things happen in the dark.